In this house up in this corner was used to barracks men. And we know that this structure was the hospital. So we're seeing kind of a concentration of the British Army in this area. This, this block was where the jail and the courthouse were. So this block up here is where the fort was. And uh, we know from research done after the war that the jail was a two-story brick building and beside it was a two-story wooden building that was the courthouse. So it would have been around those two structures that, that the British would have built their, their abdus and their trenches uh, to protect things. Now, I, I mentioned that this was the uh, taken over to be the hospital. Next to it is Isaac Marion's house. A very unfortunate place for Isaac Marion to be, considering the number of casualties his brother Francis was putting into that hospital. Um, up here again is Mitchell House and Mitchell's estate. And Mitchell's Landing would have been over here someplace, because this river comes up around here. That's the uh, hospital building, which is still in existence in Georgetown. I don't think it had those nice little awnings, but anyway, that's what it looked like. Um, again, this is an aerial view. Uh, it gives you an idea the river comes down here. Georgetown today, and this is this. We're trying to, again, trying to figure out where everything was. When we and uh, Marion attacked, in 81, they sent the infantry down the river, down the PD River, and then they spent the night on this island. And they came over in the morning, actually they came over the next night into uh, Mitchell's Point, uh, Mitchell's Landing, which is in this area, about 90 troops. So you can't say they came ashore in this one spot. You don't land, you don't land 90 soldiers in one spot. But they came ashore all along here, and they came up through the town, uh, they took the headquarters, took the commander's office, and then they attacked the fort. So the question is, where were, where were the lines? Um, the British would have put out about uh, about 200 yards, they would have put out their defenses, about a quarter of a mile out. And, and that would have been where they would have lined their soldiers up to try to meet an enemy, and then they would have fallen back on the fort. And this is actually mentioned in Harry Lee's account, uh, he says in their front they had prepared some slight defenses, better calculated to repel a sudden uh, than to attack rather than to resist a determined assault. And between the defenses and the town, and contiguous to each, was an enclosed work with a frazy or, or an abbotus uh, palisade, which constituted his chief protection. So that's kind of what the layout of the town was like. Uh, Harry Lee and uh, Marion could not take it because they did not have artillery and they had a, um, they had a, uh, a brick building that, that riflemen could not assault. When Marion took Georgetown, the first thing he did was he demolished, he demolished the, um, the British fortifications. Marion did not think that Georgetown could be held. Uh, interestingly enough, during the Civil War, the Union Army came to the same conclusion, so they did not bother to attack Georgetown. When Marion took Georgetown, he wanted to use it as a port. He moved everything upriver, uh, up the Black River to uh, Black Mingo, where he did have a fortification where he felt he could defend the supplies and everything coming into the town. So what is left in Georgetown to see from the Revolution? Not a lot, all right? You have a beautiful old town laid out along a very typical colonial uh, pattern. You can walk the streets. Uh, you can hang out on the block Francis Marion probably lived on, uh, on, on uh, Prince Street. You can uh, visit the British Hospital. You can walk up to the jail. You'll realize how short these distances are. Uh, you can realize how short and how close the battle was in Georgetown in these four attacks where, where Marion's troops and the British troops and the Tories were fighting on horseback uh, within a mile of, of the town distances were very short. And the fact that Marion was able to plunk himself down in front of that town with uh, the numbers of British troops that were there and just stay there and harass them and to, to uh, control the roads uh, meant a lot. And obviously he was 
holding down a tremendous number of British troops because they thought he had three, four, five hundred men when he had 90. So you might say, well, he only had 90 guys. But he made the most of it, and he did a very good job with those 90 guys. Uh, one of the things that William Dobbin James said, one of the best things that Marion did when he took over uh, the, um, the militia was he, he didn't have any ammunition to speak of. Uh, when he attacked Georgetown, he had less than six rounds per man. Uh, they didn't have many guns, so he had his men go out and seize swords, and he had the local blacksmiths make, uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that, he had the men go out and seize saws, and he had the local blacksmiths make swords from the saws. And those blacksmith-made swords have always been the, I would say, the Loch Ness monster of the southern campaigns because people talk about them and speculate as to what they look like, but um, everybody was guessing. And it's funny that things can hide in plain sight. When we were down here in February and I was looking uh, on information on Georgetown, I found in a book a picture of a sword owned by the Charlestown Museum, which was uh, the Ezekiel Crawford sword that was identified as being a blacksmith-made sword that was carried by Ezekiel Crawford, who was supposedly in Marion's Brigade. There is a full-scale picture of it outside. You want to get an idea how big it really is. It is, it is not crude in the least. It's quite sophisticated. This knob here is for cracking somebody's skull open. But it also counterbalances the weight of the sword to make it a more useful implement. It had a leather scabbard, which has survived with a what they call a, it's a button that go into a frog, so it could be used with the same belt that, that the British used to hold their bayonets. And impressive blade, uh, impressive guard, well made. You know, it, nothing crude about it. Probably made by folding the blade softly over on itself and, and beating it and, and welding it. The problem was there's no Ezekiel Crawford listed as having served in the American Revolution. All right. So now we have a conundrum. The blade looks good, everything about it feels right, but there's a problem. And so after running through all of the, the um, all of the lists of continental soldiers, all the lists of militia, and all the lists of everybody who served, we still could not find an Ezekiel Crawford. So I went to the genealogist, and the genealogist tells us that there was a Thomas Crawford who had two sons, Thomas Crawford from Georgetown, who had two sons, William and John, and they were both of military age during the Revolution. And John, we have a John Crawford from Georgetown, who was in the militia from 1780 to 1783, who was a horseman. And John Crawford had a son, Ezekiel. So this is Sergeant Ezekiel's sword, carried by his father, Lieutenant John Crawford, who was of Marion's brigade during the American Revolution. So the Loch Ness Monster has been found in the Charlestown Museum, and you can go and see it there if you'd like, but we have nice pictures of it outside. So thank you very much.